next speaker is Hassan uh, uh, Aslam. Uh, he's from uh, UIUC. Uh, he's a stu uh, PhD student in uh, Bill Grob, uh, Professor Bill Grubb's group. Uh, this talk, he will uh, talk about some uh, interesting uh, work on the uh, spec speculative uh, load balancing, I think based on work stealing scheme. All right. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, in this talk, I'm presenting uh, a work I've been doing on the experiment with Dr. Phil Grubb. Uh, the work is on uh, speculative load balancing. Uh, that's a technique that uh, I'll go through and see how does it affect the idle time and how can we uh, reduce the idle time with this technique. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about uh, the importance of uh, continuous dynamic load balancing in reg regular applications. Uh, those applications that has irregularity and unpredictability in their structure. And we have dynamic generation of uh, parallel uh, computation units, which are specifically coming from rested and irregular parallelism in the program. And the amount of parallelism in the program uh, changes during a time in the execution, and it's heavily dependent on the input uh, data to the program, which makes the, 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 the application uh, to be so that the, the, static dynamic, the static load balancing will not help. So we need a dynamic load balancing. So some example of that can be the optimization of search problems or uh, end body problems. So I'll jump into the problem statement and uh, talk about the assumptions that we have uh, for the, the load balancing. We assume that we have a task pool, which uh, we initialize it with the initial task we have. And then we have a loop that each thread goes through. And uh, they just get a task from the task pool and execute the task. So, uh, not, there is no need to mention that the execute function may add some uh, task into the task pool. And uh, one of the deficiencies of load balancing algorithm is that uh, we have idle time in the, in the, get, in the get state. Uh, there are solutions that uh, mitigate the problem of the, the idle time in the, in, in the get, uh, get phase. Uh, uh, the one closest uh, method to the situation is preface. So let's say in this scenario we have two threads, uh, all, rectang all uh, rectangles or tasks, black, the, the fully black rectangles or the tasks that we haven't touched yet, but those that are half full black or the tasks that we are working on. Uh, let's say uh, the threshold work prefetching is bad. Whenever we have one task remaining, we just start prefetching. So thread one start prefetching, send the request to thread two, ask for a prefetch, and thread two will send the send the task to thread one. Um, so prefetching may not be always the optimal solution. Uh, we can have some adversary scenario. Uh, for example, the task that thread one is working on may be a very heavy task, while other tasks in thread two may be very uh, light weight tasks. So thread one is still working on one task, thread two just runs off of one. Uh, so if we didn't do the, the, the prefetching, then uh, we may have a better uh, uh, algorithm. We didn't have the idle. Maybe we didn't have the idle time. But right now, thread one is working on the last task, which uh, may not be the optimal solution. Uh, the problem here is that we have the unpredictable workload here. We cannot predict what will happen in the, in the, in the future. And in some cases, prefetching is not always possible because of the limited amount of parallelism, which uh, usually comes from the, the data dependence in the algorithm. So uh, the, the, the idea, the, the, the big picture of the idea that we have uh, is similar to prefetching, but instead of just prefetching the, the task, we just get a speculative copy of the task and uh, put the actual copy of the task into the owner. So we just don't touch the, the actual copy, but we have the, the, the speculative copy in our queue. Uh, whenever we have that scenario that uh, we are going to start working on the speculative task, uh, instead of just starting working on that, when I start working on that, I, I also send a request to the owner of the task to see if the working on the task is, a, is okay or not. It's uh, uh, just, just an arbitration request. Uh, but in this case, the thread two is already working on the task, 
so it just returns a speculation failed thread one. So whatever thread one has been done is just a waste of uh, time maybe, and it just rolls back everything that it has been done. But at least uh, the path has been started earlier in this case than the two cases. Uh, we applied uh, the idea of uh, speculation to uh, one example of the algorithm that's called word sharing. Uh, let's first discuss about the word sharing algorithm, the original case. Uh, we have a manager, which is a, uh, a, a centralized task force. Uh, let's say uh, the algorithm is not hierarchic, uh, the hierarchical word sharing, it's just a simple word sharing algorithm with one manager and so many threads underneath. And uh, at some point, uh, one thread may have, uh, may generate a lot of work, and in work sharing algorithm, it's usually the case that we have a, we have a threshold that whenever a thread uh, has more uh, paths at that threshold, then they just release a path to the manager. So let's say a threshold is two, and after two paths, we just uh, release in extra work that we have to the manager. Here, thread zero, just release one path, get it out of the queue, send it to the manager, manager put it inside its queue, and then the manager choose one of the work requests coming from one of the threads and then put that into the, uh, and send it to one of the threads waiting for its follow up. And at some point in the, uh, in the, in, in the execution, all the threads have some paths to work on and manager has uh, <coughs> uh, a, a number of paths in its queue. Uh, what will happen if we apply the idea of a speculation into the word sharing algorithm, which is a very good fit, uh, uh, like the word sharing is a very good fit for the thread. So the same scenario here, we have three tasks in the thread zero. Thread zero just send the, the actual work to the manager. The, the owner of the work is actually manager here, and th that's what thread zero thinks about. But the speculated path still remains in the thread zero queue. Uh, so what will happen with the, the task in the speculated queue? Uh, let's say I have one worker. Uh, it has uh, two actual tasks. It's just threshold for one, actual task for two. And it has several speculated tasks in its own queue. And uh, uh, speculated uh, uh, container in that dash to standard. So the scenario is that uh, the worker thread uh, works on the task and at some point runs out of the the actual task. What do we do? Uh, the worker thread uh, starts working on the speculated task, the most recent speculated task. Of, uh, I, I, I forgot to tell that this uh, uh, queue here, whatever whatever task comes uh, in, in, in the top, they are most they're, they're more recent tasks. So for uh, for this task here, we sent the that the, we, we released it re, uh, more recent than this one and then this one and so on and so forth. So we start working on this one because uh, we have a higher chance to get a, uh, to get a success in the, speculator, in the speculation on working on this task because uh, it may not be given to any other uh, thread here. So uh, once we start working on this task, we also send an arbitration request for this task to the thread to the, to the manager thread, and then uh, we go on uh, for other speculated tasks in the queue and wait for the manager to get the response for the speculation that we have done. So let's say we have done the speculation for A, B, C, D, and right now we are sending the, the arbitration request for E, and at the middle of execution for E, we get the, we get the response from manager that the, arbit the, that the speculation for task A was a successful speculation. So we just commit the result for uh, we just commit the result from executing task A. So before that, we don't do anything with the, with the, the, with the result for executing task A. Then we get a successful task B, and we do the commit, so on and so forth. But let's say we get the, the, the failure from, for task C, because task C was uh, more recent than B, E, and this one. Uh, if this one is getting a fail, it means that this task has been given to one other processor. So this one, so this one, so this one, all of them have been given to other processors. So what they have to do is just rolling back all the results from the speculation and deleting whatever we have in the speculated task queue. So uh, <coughs> that is the, the general idea of the speculation. 
Uh, and then after that, uh, the, the third, the, the most favorite, the third, the most requested one of the two uh, Let's see what would be the result if we apply the, the, the idea of a situation of world pairing and see what would be the, the, com the comparison with the original algorithm. Uh, we use the, the, the UTS benchmark on balanced spin search. The goal of the unbalanced spin search is to count the number of nodes in a randomly generated tree. Uh, the generation of the tree is based on a separable cryptographic random number generator, let's say SHA-1. Uh, we have two functions, uh, function S, which I will talk about that in a, in a second, and then SHA-1. Uh, the, the way that the tree is generated is that each node in the tree has an ID, let's say node, node ID, which is a any byte number. Then uh, from this function f, we can find the number of children of that node, and then we can apply the one index to, with the node ID to that separable cryptographic random number generator with SHA-1 and then get the child ID. So if we start with the node ID of the root, we can build the whole tree from the root, children of root, then children of children of root, and so on and so forth. So we can build the whole tree. So uh, the shape of the tree depends on this f over here. Uh, different types of the tree can be built by different uh, functions of f. Let's say f returns n with the probability of q returns 0 with probability of 1 minus q. So we have a finite matrix. Or let's say f limits the depth of a tree to b and uh, returns a value between, returns a value with uh, a geometric distribution with the mean of b. So we have a geometric tree. Uh, so in this uh, picture here, we have a, binary, a binomial tree with uh, n equal to half 2, for example. So uh, the way that mode pairing uh, applies to UTS is that a node in the tree is the unit of power computation. But a node is so small that we don't want to transfer just one node, so we pack a set of nodes together and we put them into one chunk and we just play with the chunk size and uh, chunk is a minimum transfer by one in our system. Uh, obviously, if we increase uh, the chunk size, uh, we decrease the amount of powers in our system. If we decrease the chunk size, we have so many messages in the system which we work does not match. There is also one, one more uh, parameter which we call release interval. The release interval is the frequency with which a motor releases a work to manager. So after each period of release interval, a worker checks if it has an extra work to send to release to manager and it does the, 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 the release. Uh, again, if release interval is so large, uh, we don't get a chance to announce our values to manager often, and if release interval is so small, then uh, we have so much of overhead on the worker. So there's a trade-off between the values for release interval and chunk size, and we have to tune the algorithm find the optimal value for release interval and chunk size, and then, uh, uh, and then see the actual effect. So the experimental setup that we have used, uh, because work pairing right now is just, uh, we, we are not going to run it on a large cluster. It's a uh, the top cluster in, uh, in campus. It's uh, each node has a set of four in it. Um, the, the inputs that we use, we use two graphs, binomial and geometric, uh, with three size, small, medium, and large. The small and medium size are used for tuning, and the large for scale and size. So we see what will happen. So I, I tr I al I al I've already told you about the, the tuning for chunk size and polar interval. This, these graphs here are the, uh, are the effects of polar interval and chunk size. So for each polar interval, uh, you can see different polar intervals here, and uh, the chunk size here, you can see what would be the execution time. And if we uh, apply the, a, 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 a good set of polar interval with different chunk size, you'll see uh, this graph here. I, uh, I know it's uh, not so readable, but the, the point in this graph is that because the input was small, we have a long tail here, which is flat, and we don't know exactly what would be the optimal value for the release interval and chunk size here. This is done on the original algorithm. Uh, but you can also see we have so much of the sensitivity to the uh, parameters in the algorithm. Like from 4 to 8, we have this much of the sensitivity and uh, different values for the minimum for four. So uh, 
Other than that, I want to compare the results that's coming from the circulative algorithm and original algorithm. We can see much less sensitivity in the circulative algorithm with respect to the different parameters that we have, the full interval and transparency. Um, but at least from the tuning and the small input, we can see what are the desired uh, input desired parameters that we have, so we can limit the, the parameter of the full interval and trunk size and do the tuning again in the medium size uh, input. So we just get uh, these uh, parameters, these range of parameters, and do the tuning again on the medium size uh, input. But again, you can see in original algorithm, we have so much of the uh, sensitivity. Let's say for 16, I have these uh, graph coming from here to here and then again here. So it means that if I don't choose the optimal value, then I cannot expect that the, the algorithm works well. It may have lots of violations. Uh, from this graph, uh, we found that the optimal value is uh, for the for following interval is 128. 128 has three points, one here, one here, and one here. The optimal value is the trunk size of 12. But the trunk size of 8 and trunk size of 16 is not too much different from what we get from what trunk size of 12. So that's what we can see from the, the medium size input. But let's see what will happen if we apply trunk size of, uh, so the optimal value is trunk size of 12. So if we apply trunk size of 8, it's just a small, uh, a small variation of the trunk size of 4 uh, nodes less than 12, we can get like twice the, the amount of the, the execution time in the original algorithm. You can see so much of the sensitivity of the sensitivity, so much of the sensitivity in the original algorithm. But uh, you can see the circulative algorithm is almost uh, the same in both cases. Uh, these are the results that are around eight nodes with the uh, with the large input. So let's see what would be the the scalability study if you run the circulative and original algorithm. Um, in the geometric tree, so we, we run it on four node, eight node, 16, 32, and 64 nodes. Each node shares four, which means the maximum number of cores we have is uh, 768. Uh, you can see almost we have uh, two times speed of this circulative algorithm on larger nodes. So it's almost expected from the circulative approach because we don't put too much of the stress on the manager. Um, because anyone has its own circulated path in its team, so they just work on the circulated path. Uh, on the binomial tree, the point that I want to show here is, uh, again, we have the better scalability here for the circulated algorithm, but you can see the, the, the overheads, th there's a slight overhead of the cir circulated approach uh, in the small cases, but in the large cases, circulated approach is missing. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to just tell that a circulation is a general idea that can be applied to a load balancing algorithm. Uh, that's the, that's uh, a large spaces need, which we have seen in the binomial tree. And that's a potential solution that we can eliminate idle times and reduce the sensitivity of the, 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 of the, the, the load balancing algorithm to the parameters. And uh, so with the, with the Load balancing, we probably don't need too much of the tuning, just a small tuning is enough for getting the, the performance that we want, and we have a higher scalability. Uh, any question? It's, uh, it seems like, uh, say, I mean, uh, looking at charm seed balancers as my example, but there are two times when you exchange work. One is periodic in, in charm seed balancers. The other one is when you go idle. When you are about to go idle, you can define the going idle as completely idle or few tasks left in it. So compare, compared with that, I mean, I don't know what speculation is. Uh, distinct from just taking work from someone else when you are going idle, is it? Uh, uh, that thing that you are talking is actually two sets. So uh -huh. what we are doing is we replicate the work, we treat the circulated chunks or treat the sorry. Somehow, I, is it? Okay, maybe it is uh, there. Treat the circulated work as second class citizens in our whole system. So 
So when they start working on them, we don't know if those are past or a, past, a valid past to work, question that we are working on them, as we hope that no one else has started working on them. So we can just review further. And what is the difference between it being speculative and or it being actually taken by someone else? So I mean, uh, I, yes. Uh, so I it is available on two different queues at the same time, so it doesn't yeah. need to be moved between them. That's the benefit, looks to me like. Uh, you move them when you already have the work, so you, you don't have to wait for. Wait the, for, okay, understood. Uh, but you can just, uh, you, you can compare that with a prefetching based algorithm. Then again, you move the chunks between processes when you have a chunk, when you have, you, are, you have the work. But in prefetching, there are some adversary cases where you don't get the optimal solution. Yep. Uh -huh. And uh, we actually implemented the prefetching based algorithm for the, the, the work training, and the results are the same, and the reason are the same as the original version, and the reason for that is we don't have too much of a predictability in the structure of the, uh, right. and the structure of that one balance sheet. Right. So uh, prefetching may not work well. Okay. Okay. Any other question? Thanks. Let me introduce the next speaker, um, uh, Lasio Pila. Uh, he's from uh, 